This mistake could be costing you millions of dollars in retirement, and it's something people do all of the time. Hi, I'm Chloe Bear, also known as Chloe. I'm a financial coach, creator, and blogger. On this channel, you'll find a ton of different tips on how to money, including how to start investing as a beginner, as well as how to make a budget and things like that. In today's video, we are going to be talking about the top mistakes that people make when they just start investing. And there's a lot of them. New investors are often very, very susceptible to these mistakes. So you wanna be sure to watch till the end of the video so that you're not making any of these mistakes and they're not costing you millions of dollars. But before we get to it, be sure to hit like, hit subscribe. It helps me out a lot. And if you find this content useful or if you want to see more content like that, hitting the like button, hitting the subscribe button is an easy and free way to support me. So thank you. So let's get right to it. The first biggest mistake that I see investors, especially new investors making, is that they're waiting to start investing. The thing is you don't want to wait when it comes to investing because the waiting could play out for several years. And if you start, let's say you start in your 20s, you're doing a much better job than what you're doing if you start in your 30s. Waiting is never going to benefit you. Think about it this way. If you started investing $300 a month at the age of 20, by the time you were 65, you would have $1.9 million invested. And that's assuming that a 9% average annual return is happening which is not off base considering that the entire stock market on average over the last hundred years has returned about 10% before inflation. Now let's say you decided that you were going to wait 10 years and start investing when you're 30. In order to get to that $1.9 million, instead of just investing $300 a month, you now have to invest $750 a month. And I don't know about you, but it's a whole lot easier to invest $300 a month for the rest of your life than it is to invest just $750. $50 for the rest of your life. Time is one of your biggest assets when it comes to investing. So if you're able to get started, even if it's only $25 a month, starting earlier is really going to allow your money to grow and the impacts of starting early are just exponential. Logan decided she wanted to join this conversation about investing. So here she is. Um, but the second biggest mistake when it comes to investing is that people aren't actually investing. Let's say they go, they open their Roth IRA or they open their 401k, they put some money in and that's it. If you do that and you don't actually pick investments, you're not actually investing, which really sucks. I have had so many clients who thought that they had been investing for five years or more, and actually their money was just sitting in a settlement fund inside of a Roth IRA, which means that it was making literally no interest whatsoever, just sitting there, losing value every year because of inflation. What you need to do is you need to remember that investing is always a three-step process. First, you open the brokerage account, then you transfer money from your bank account into the brokerage account, and then you pick investments. Don't forget this step, that could cost you so much money. Think about our previous example where we were talking about waiting to invest. Let's say you opened a Roth IRA at 20 years old and you invested $300 a month without ever actually purchasing investments. That means, let's say by the age of 30, you realize, holy crap, I've never actually invested any of this money. If you just save $300 a month for 10 years, that's only $36,000. If you invested that $300 a month instead, and we're getting about 9% annual average returns, that would be $55,000 in 10 years instead. That's a pretty big difference while having the same amount of effort. I would be so ticked if I had been, thought I had been investing $300 a month, but I had only been saving $300 a month. That's gonna make a huge difference in your long-term gains as well. Think about it this way. If you were able to invest that $300 a month and you actually purchased investments for the entire 45 years that you were investing, you would have that $1.9 million. But if you forgot to invest it and you figured out 10 years after you forgot to invest it, then you would only have $36,000 after 10 years to start investing. If you then start investing with that $36,000 from the age of 30 to 65, by the time you're 65, you would only have $1.5 million invested. So that's a 
$400,000 different just for forgetting to invest that money for 10 years. So remember, again, it's a three-step process. Open the account, move money into the account, and buy those investments. The third biggest mistakes that I see beginning investors often making is that they're completely relying on a financial advisor without doing any research or education on their own. While that may in theory seem like a good idea, the thing is is that financial advisors, there are good ones and then there are bad ones. Financial advisors who are not CFPs or CFAs do not have to abide by the fiduciary standard. The fiduciary standard basically means that somebody who acts under the fiduciary standard has to make sure that whatever they are selling you, whatever they are telling you is something that they truly believe is acting on your best interests. A lot of financial advisors do not practice under the fiduciary standard they actually practice under something called the suitability standard. The suitability standard's very different. Suitability means they could say it suits you. So let's say you come into their office and you explain that you feel anxious about investing because you don't want to lose your money. They could put you in a 100% bond portfolio and say that it suited you because you were afraid to invest. But that's not actually acting in your best interest. Also with financial advisors, oftentimes they receive very large commissions for selling you insurance products or other investment products. So they can just sell you something, say that it suits you, and actually the reason that they're selling it to you is because they're making a huge commission. We want to have enough knowledge to understand what our financial advisors are recommending us so that we can decide whether or not we think it's right for us or not. If you're working with a CFP, it's a little bit different scenario in that they are supposed to have your best interests in mind. They practice under their fiduciary standard, so they could be liable if they sold you something or gave you advice that wasn't actually in your best interest. So they're going to go the extra mile. But if you're just using a financial advisor that has none of those certifications and practices under a suitability standard, you don't have those same protections that you would have if you were using a someone who worked under a fiduciary standard. How do you find out? All you gotta do is ask your financial advisor, are you working under a suitability standard or a fiduciary standard? That's it. Another reason that relying solely on your financial advisor to manage all of your money is that no one's ever going to care about your money as much as you're going to care about your money. So especially if somebody's acting under a suitability standard, they aren't necessarily always going to have your best interests in mind. Only you can really know what's in your best interest. And the only way to know if what you're investing in is what's best for you is for you to learn a little bit about investing so that you can be analytical when they make recommendations. And that leads me into the fourth mistake that beginning investors make is that they don't do any research on their own. The thing is, is that learning how to invest and spending time investing and managing your money, it's kind of a lifelong practice. There's so much out there to learn and just taking a little bit of time to learn about investments could mean the difference between you having a well-performing portfolio or having a really poorly designed portfolio that's not gonna return the returns that you're looking for. There is so much free information out there that it's really not an excuse to not know at least the bare minimums when it comes to investing. You wanna know what the best practices are so that at least even if you're working with a financial advisor, even if you're working with a robo-advisor, you have that peace of mind and knowing like, I know what this portfolio means, I know what I'm invested in, and I know the risks, the pros, and the cons for the things that I'm invested in, so I feel good about it. To me, that gives you so much peace of mind. Whereas if you are just buying YOLO stocks that somebody on the internet recommends without really doing any of your own research, without understanding what you're purchasing, you're gonna possibly end up in a situation where you have a very volatile portfolio when really maybe you didn't actually want a volatile portfolio. Maybe you wanted a portfolio that was gonna give you lower gains, but very consistent gains, like through investing in something like an index fund. So that's why I recommend pretty much everyone spend at least a little bit of time educating yourself. And what I mean by that is at least look at what you're investing in. At least get an understanding of what your portfolio is made up of. Even if you have a financial advisor or even if you have a robo-advisor, you can go into the portfolio that they created for you and start seeing, oh, they have me in VT Sachs. VT Sachs is a total stock market index fund. How do you find that out? You just Google VT Sachs and it'll show you all the information, the expense ratios, what the holdings are, what the performance is and all that good stuff. Speaking of index funds, the fifth biggest mistake that I see 
see new investors making is that they go straight to picking stocks. Now, I am not against you picking individual stocks. The thing is though, once you're a new investor, you might have this idea that you're better at picking stocks than you actually are. And in order to avoid that, that overconfidence in picking stocks, a good thing to start with is buying the entire stock market. So if you start building your portfolio, buying index funds that are focused on broad indexes like the total stock market, like the S&P 500, like the NASDAQ, you're going to be purchasing entire portfolios of stocks instead of trying to pick out individual stocks that you think are going to do well. The reason that I say that this is not such a great move for beginning investors is because picking individual stocks is really hard. Unless you're picking out big stocks like Amazon and Google and Apple and Tesla, when you're trying to pick individual stocks that you think are going to do well, the success rate of that's just pretty low. When we think about actively managed mutual funds versus passively managed mutual funds, and that's actively managed mutual funds versus index funds, those index funds are passively managed. They're designed to mirror a market. So they have the entire stock market in a total stock market index fund, or they have the entire portfolio of the S&P 500 in an S&P 500 index fund. Actively managed mutual funds, on the other hand, are designed to try and beat the market. So you have the Brads and Joes who went to Harvard, who went to Yale, actively trading inside of those mutual funds to try and give you as much return as possible. When we look at the performance of index funds versus actively managed, managed mutual funds, index funds outperform actively managed mutual funds by 92% of the time over the long term. So think about it that way. The Brads and Joes of the world who are literally paid to beat the market can't beat the market 92% of the time over the long term. So personally, if they can't do it, I don't feel like I can do it. I don't wanna spend all of my time looking into different companies and researching what's gonna be the next big thing or looking at how, how the economy is doing and what kind of patterns I'm seeing. Like that's just not what I wanna do. Instead, I'd rather buy the whole stock market using index funds. So that's why even if you someday do want to purchase individual stocks, I recommend and starting with those index funds to give yourself a big, a nice broad base where you're diversified and you're, you've got that cushion. And then if you wanna invest in individual stocks on top of that, then go for it. Now that brings me to my sixth biggest mistake that I see beginning investors making, and that is not diversifying. So a lot of beginning investors really like the idea of buying individual stocks. So they'll buy a share of Apple, or they'll buy a share of Alphabet, or they'll buy a share of Tesla, and they only have three stocks in their whole portfolio. Now, even though the stocks that I was just talking about, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, those are all really good stocks, but they're still only individual companies. So if Jeff Bezos goes out there and says something that makes everyone hate him even more than they do now, and the value of Amazon just starts tanking, your investment's going to tank right along with Jeff Bezos. So you don't want to just rely heavily on one or two or three stocks. You wanna be diversified in as many companies as you can. And that's again, why I talk about index funds and why I particularly like index funds is because index funds are going to have hundreds if not thousands of stocks inside of them. You also wanna be investing in the international market as well. The reason we like to invest in the international market is because we want some exposure to other currencies and other companies outside of the US that are not going to be impacted when the US economy is not doing well. So we wanna kind of be able to protect ourselves when the US economy is not doing well. We have these international stocks and bonds to kind of hold up our portfolio. Not only do you want some domestic stocks with US stocks inside of your portfolio or international stocks inside of your portfolio, but you might also wanna look at diversifying in other ways as well. Instead of just investing in equities or stocks, maybe look into investing in some real estate through REITs, also known as REITs. The idea behind investing in different kinds of assets is to protect you from when another asset's not doing well. So one of the things that happens with REITs and stocks is that when stocks are doing well, it's often common for REITs to not be doing as well. And when REITs are doing really well, it's very common for the stocks not to be doing as well. That's why we kind of want to have that balance because it helps our portfolio maintain its value even when some 
some of the assets inside of our portfolio aren't doing as well. Now, the seventh biggest mistake that I see newbie investors making is that they're trying to time the market. And what do I mean by that? So when we talk about timing the market, that means we're trying to see when stock prices are going to sink so that we can buy low and sell high. So we, we look and we look and we see, oh my gosh, Netflix is down a hundred dollars today. Well, I'm going to buy now and then I'm going to watch. And then whenever it goes up $200, I'm going to sell it. And the reason that this is tricky is because it's really, really hard to beat the market. Like we were talking about earlier, even the Brad's and Joe's who were professionally trained to beat the market failed to do so over the long term. You might be able to do it in the short term, pick a couple of stocks that happen to be winners over the very short term, but in able to do that consistently all of the time, it's a really, really hard thing to do. And it's also a really risky way to invest. Personally, that's not what I want to do. Personally, I would much rather just spend time in the market. The thing is when you zoom out of the stock market as a whole, even though when you're zoomed in really close, you'll see the ups and downs all the time. But when you zoom out, you'll see the trend, especially when we look at like the S&P 500, the trend is just going upward. Of course you have the peaks and valleys. That's normal. You're going to have the peaks and valleys. But the thing is, if you don't try to time the market and instead you're consistently investing often and as much as possible, your money is going to consistently grow over the long term. But if you're trying to time the market, you're way more likely to lose money. There's actually a statistic that says that studied the S&P 500 and shows that if you invest your money for longer than 15 years inside of the S&P 500, your chance of losing money goes down to 0%. That's pretty cool. But when we try to time the market, our chances of failing to beat the market, it goes way up the shorter time period that we're investing. So while maybe Maybe someday you want to do some day trading to try and time the market and make much money as possible. When you're just starting out, it's a good idea to not try and time the market. Instead, consistently buy the funds that you want to buy or the stocks that you want to buy over the long term and just kind of let it ride out. If you wanted to time it, if you wanted to start doing that stock trading and trying to time the market, that's something that you can do when you already have your foundations covered. You've already got most of your portfolio and pretty stable investments that are going to grow over the long term. And then if you want to do some trading on the side, go for it. Okay. Now the eighth biggest mistake that I see investors doing all of the time is panic selling when the stock market goes down. The thing is, is that the stock market's going to go down all the time. That is super, super normal. That's supposed to happen. The problem is when you see that and you think, oh my God, the stock market's calling. It's never going to come back up. What do we do? What do we do? I'm just going to sell. Then you're going to actually lose money. But if instead when stock markets go down, you just keep your money in there, you're not actually seeing any losses until you pull that money out. And by the time you pull the money out, we're hoping that when you pull that money out, it's a much higher place. It's not in one of the dips of the market. Think about it this way. The stock market will crash every five to seven years. That's totally normal. And as long as you go into investing, knowing that the stock market's going to crash every five to seven years, then you're good. In those times where it crashes, you buy more stocks, you buy more funds because essentially that is when stocks are on sale. Now, when we go shopping, we don't run out of the store the second that things go on sale. Instead, we go in and we buy more. Stocks are no different. Index funds are no different. Mutual funds are no different. You still want to be able to buy them when they sink. But the best thing to do is just consistently buy for the long term and ride out any crashes in the market. When people complain and say that they lost money in the market, it's often because they sold, they panic sold, they let their emotions get to them and they sold when the market was down. But if they had waited another few years, then those stock prices would have gone up again. Obviously it depends on what they were invested in, but if they were invested in something of the S and P 500 or the total stock market, then like I said, historically speaking, it always goes up even with the peaks and valleys that we see on a day to day basis. So that's pretty much it. Those are some of the biggest mistakes that I see newbie investors making all of the time. And if you avoid these mistakes and you start going in and you invest in low cost index funds, you buy and hold, you don't invest in really risky investments, then you're going to see a lot of success in investing in the stock market. I really love investing in a really lazy way. I like buying and holding index funds and index ETFs. 
ETFs and just kind of letting the market do its thing. I find that to be one of the easiest ways to invest and one of the most effective ways to invest as well. And I'm not spending all of my time researching companies or worrying about how the stock market is doing. And when the stock market goes down, if I have extra money, I try to buy more because essentially who wouldn't want to buy Amazon at a discount? So anyway, I hope this was helpful. Let me know what questions you have in the comments or let me know what else you would add to this list. There are so many mistakes that can be made when investing, but I think I covered some of the biggest ones. If you think of something else, let me know in the comments. And if you're not already following me on Instagram and TikTok, be sure to follow me here. I am posting on each of those platforms multiple times a day and it is all money content. So go find me there. And again, if you've made it this far and you haven't already hit liked or subscribe, go ahead and do that. It helps me out a lot. So that's all I have for you guys. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Bye.